So we're going to just finish up here <coughs> with this section about ecology. So remember, ecology is a science that studies interactions between living things and each other, and also interactions between living and non-living things as well. So we just were looking at owl pellets, and we know that owls affect the populations of their prey. So that interaction is part of ecology. There's also some other types of interactions that species have that are called symbiotic relationships. A symbiotic relationship is one in which the organisms live very close and close associations with each other. It's more than just predator-prey relationships. And we have like three categories of these um, symbiotic relationships. The first one is called the mutualism. In this symbiotic relationship, the two organisms that live in close association, they both benefit in some way from this relationship. For example, a termite. You know anything about termites? They eat wood. You do not want them in your house, right? Because they could destroy the uh, structure of your home. Termites actually on their own, they can't digest wood. Instead, what happens is inside of the gut of a termite, there's this protus, another organism, lives in there. And so the termite itself chews up the wood and swallows it. But then this protus actually breaks it down and digests it. And so they're living together. They have this symbiotic relationship. The parasite benefits because once this wood is broken down by the, by the protus, it can then absorb some of the energy from it. The protus benefits because it's living in a nice little cozy environment of the termite's gut, and it's just getting fed this constant source of chewed up wood. So both of them benefit. We have a symbiotic relationship that's kind of similar. In our gut, we have lots of helpful, beneficial bacteria that help break down certain foods that we can't digest on our own. Certain bacteria that provide us with, with vitamins, like vitamin K, they live in close association with us. Um, so that's an example of mutualism. Both organisms are benefited. Uh, another example of this, there's this um, animal called the Nile, um, there's a Nile crocodile, ferocious predator that lives in the Nile River in Africa. And there's also this bird, um, an Egyptian plover, that actually crawls into the crocodile's mouth. Crocodile opens its mouth, lets this bird walk in, peck around in its mouth, and just leave. And the crocodile never eats the bird. And these two organisms have a mutualistic relationship. They both are benefiting. What do you think the bird gets? Yeah, it's pecking around in the crocodile's teeth. It's getting out little bits of food that are stuck there. So it's getting a meal out of this relationship. What's the crocodile get? Yeah, clean teeth that don't get infected and, and healthy mouth. Um, and so they're both benefiting in that situation. That would be another example of mutualism. They're both benefiting. Another type of symbiotic relationship is called commensalism. It's probably one you maybe never heard of before. This is one in which one organism benefits, but the other one isn't really affected in any way. It's not helped, but it's also not harmed in any way. A famous example of this is barnacles. Barnacles are this, these marine organisms. They form a shell. They attach to a surface, and basically they're filter feeders. They filter little bits of food out of the water. They often will attach to whales on their flippers or on their body. And as the whales swimming through the water, the barnacles can then filter out bits of food for energy. It doesn't hurt the whale, 
it doesn't help the whale either. So this is an example of commensalism. The barnacle is benefiting. The whale is not really affected either way. So mutualism, both organisms benefit. Commensalism, one benefits, one's not affected. What do you think the third type is? One organism that benefits and what happens to the other? Harm. So this is something you're familiar with, parasites. Parasitism is when there is this close relationship between the organisms, and one organism benefits, but one is actually harmed in some way. What do we call the thing that benefits? The thing that's getting something positive. That's the parasite. What's the thing that lives in or on all of them? You know what you call the thing? Host, it's called the host. So here's some there's many, many examples of parasite host relationships. Here's one that I've seen. This is um, a lake drought. Um, and when I was in college, I took a class about fish, ichthyology is called. And I went to I went to um, college in Vermont, University of Vermont, on Lake Champlain. And one of our labs, we'd go out on the lake in this fishing boat, and we put the nets in the water, hauled them up, and we were like looking at the different fish that we caught. And what we saw is that some of the lake trout that we caught that were pretty big, they had wounds in the side of them. Very large sort of round wounds. Some of them were like open sores. Some of them were like healed up. Some of the fish we brought up actually had lamprey attached to them this. A lamprey is another type of fish. This is what its mouth looks like. It's a parasitic fish. Lamprey, they look like eels. They're long. Um, they don't have a jaw that opens and closes. They have this round mouth. They have these sharp teeth. Their tongue has teeth on it that they basically use to drill into the side of a large fish. So these lamprey attach to a large fish. They sort of drill a hole in it, and then they survive by digesting the blood of that fish. They're almost like a really large leech, but they stay attached for a long period of time. A leech typically attaches, fills up with blood, and then detaches. These lamprey will stay attached for a, a while, and they harm the fish, obviously. The fish has a wound in it. It's losing blood. It's losing energy. Eventually, it can kill the fish even. But that's an example of a parasitic relationship. The lamprey benefits. It's getting food. That's how it gets its nutrition. The lake trout is being harmed and so on. Wait, was it no, no, because as soon as it like came near you, like you would, like a fish can't do anything to get it off, you know, it can squiggle or whatever. But you, if a lamprey ever came, near you and like this. so my professor took some of these lamprey we caught he had like this big rubber apron on and he like held the lamprey towards his apron and it did suction on it was like um but he could just pull it off so they wouldn't they don't really affect you um but uh they do affect large fish a tick is another example of a parasite right ticks live on animals burrow into and under their skin, and they live off of digesting blood from that organism. Uh, tapeworm, have you ever heard of a tapeworm? Tapeworm is a parasite of animals. My dog once had a tapeworm. Um, well, here's a couple of worms, worm stories. One, I first got a dog, um, was taking her in the backyard, and she went to the bathroom, and I noticed after she went, on the little pile that she left, there's a little like white thing. It looked like about the size of a grain of rice, but it was like moving. And so I knew what that was. It was she had a tapeworm. In her digestive tract somewhere, she had a tapeworm. Uh, tapeworms are parasitic worms of the digestive system usually. So they attach into the digestive system of an animal, and as the animal eats food, the tapeworm is absorbing some of that nutrition. Um, they can make a person sick or an animal sick. Humans can get tapeworms. Um, 
they benefit because they're getting a constant source of food, but they can they harm the person because they lose nutrients. Um, and they reproduce because when my dog went to the bathroom, what I saw was just a piece of the tapeworm. A piece will break off every once in a while and come out with the feces. So if another dog, like from my neighborhood, came around my backyard and was like smelling around where my dog went to the bathroom, that dog could then ingest the tapeworm and then it would be infected. And that's how they spread from one organism to another. Another worm story I have for you is, um, that, that was our first dog. Our second dog that we ever got was a little Chihuahua Terrier mix. And we got her really early. So if you've ever like gotten a dog, usually you get them after like eight or 10 weeks, right after they were born. Um, and usually the breeder will have dewormed the dog. Most puppies in their early um, lives get infected from their parents with parasitic worms. And usually there's a medication you give a puppy called a dewormer. It's just like a single pill you give the dog and basically kills any parasitic worms. So usually they do that wherever you got your dog, at the breeder, and you don't have to experience this. I don't know, for some reason, we got our dog early, and it was too early, so we had to give it the deworming medication when it was like eight weeks old. And so she was like this big. We gave her the deworming medication, and within like 24 hours, every single time she went to the bathroom, it looked like, um, like a plate of spaghetti. There were just tons of these worms that were coming out. They died after she took after we gave her this medicine, but then they come out when they go to the bathroom. And it was worms that were longer than her entire length of her body were coming out after we gave her the deer. It was pretty gross. Anyway. Um, Can't dogs get like heartworms? Yeah, oh, that's another. I thought I had a picture. Yeah, heartworm. Uh, if you have a dog, maybe every month you give it, or every three months, a little heart guard medication. It looks like a treat. That's to prevent another parasitic worm. Yeah, heartworm is another flatworm, but it parasitizes dogs. It doesn't live in their digestive system. It makes its way into their circulatory system. And these worms live in their heart, and they start off small, but as they grow and reproduce, they can get so much that they clog the heart, and they can actually kill the dog. Um, and that's why heart guard and so forth are um, medications you give your dog that prevents heartworm. Okay, um, in an ecosystem, all living things, plants, for example, need nutrients, right? Plants, we talked about with our, our bean plants that we were growing. They weren't looking too healthy, and what I was saying is that they probably don't have enough nutrients in the soil. Plants need nitrogen. They need phosphorus. They need potassium. Um, they need water, obviously. And so within an ecosystem, those elements, those materials get cycled. And we call those material cycles, okay? The, and the materials that make up living organisms are constantly cycled. Um, the carbon that's in your body that makes up your tissues, sometime in the past it may have been part of a tree. Right? or part of a dinosaur, or who knows, the materials we have on Earth are just constantly being recycled. And they do that with the help of decomposers. When an organism dies, you know, if you ever see like roadkill on the side of the road, um, eventually it breaks down, it decomposes. And bacteria and fungi, what they do is they basically digest the tissue of that organism and use some of it for energy and they return those nutrients back into the ecosystem and then new organisms can then use those materials and incorporate them into their body tissue so all materials and ecosystems are recycled over and over again water for example here's an here is the water cycle you know when water falls from the sky it can go into the ground it can be taken up by plants it can be released back into the atmosphere. Some of it can return through rivers and streams to lakes or oceans. It can evaporate back in the atmosphere. We have this constant 
cycling of water in the atmosphere. We have oxygen and carbon are also cycled in the same way. Um, we could see, you know, carbon is um, taken in by plants, incorporated into their tissue. Herbivores eat the plants, that's how they get carbon. Animals eat the herbivores to get that. And so this carbon gets recycled over and over again. Nitrogen gets cycled. Nitrogen is an important element for all living things. Phosphorus. These are all these materials just get recycled over and over again. And it's decomposers that do a lot of that work. Fungi and bacteria are what actually decompose living things. Um, I just read an article this weekend, it was about human composting, which um, is, is legal in like seven states. Some people, their wishes after they die is that their body, rather than being embalmed and buried like in a coffin and things like that, is they want to be composted. And they're basically, they put the body in with some soil and nutrients and their body quickly decomposes and then they can return their nutrients back to the earth again. Um, we talked about this the other day a little bit. If they stopped mowing this lawn, right out here outside the window, tell me what it would look like in a month. The long grass, right? About in a year. Maybe not trees yet, but like lots of like weeds and like over time would start to grow. How about 10 years? Maybe there'd be like some small shrubs growing or like, you know, fast growing trees over time. What if you came back in 150 years of leaving this undisturbed? It'd be a forest. Around here, it would be a forest. That process that would take a disturbed area and eventually allow it to reach the forest ecosystem is called succession. Okay. Succession is when the organisms in a community change over time. Each species that comes in modifies the environment a little bit, making it more suitable to the next species. And this is what it kind of looks like in our area. If you like, um, if you burn a forest down, you shouldn't do this. But if you burn a forest, if a person burned a forest, if our forest burned and then was left, the first things that would start to grow would be small, little, fast growing plants. Then maybe some um, larger plants and then some woody shrubs and some quick growing trees and eventually larger trees. That's our area. It's not everywhere though. If you were to go to um, the Midwest of the United States and do the same thing, the result wouldn't be a forest. The result likely would be a grassland. The natural, um, we call those things the climax, the final stage. In the Midwest of the United States, it's a, um, it might be a grassland. If you went to the southeast, southwest of the United States, it might be a desert ecosystem. Just depends on the climate, what the final climax community might be. We also have a term for the very first things that can start to grow in an environment. And they are called the pioneer species, the first things that can move in. This can even happen from bare rock. You ever like went hiking up a pretty tall mountain where the top is just bare rock? What you might notice is that in little pockets, there might be some plants growing on that bare rock. What typically would happen is small things like lichen and moss and things like that, they can grow even on bare rock. They need no soil. And so they are the first things, they are the pioneer organisms that start to grow and as they grow and then die and decompose, they start to build up a very thin layer of soil, right? They're changing the environment. 
then maybe some small plants can actually take root in that soil. And as they grow and die and decompose, the soil becomes thicker. And then larger plants can come in. Each stage is kind of changing the environment, allowing for the next stage to come in. And you can see this oftentimes if you go and, and see uh, a rock slide or something, you can see this starting to happen. And here's what it looks like. Here are the various biomes you find throughout the world. Like we said, this is us, Northeast United States. The typ typical biome that you find is what's called, our forests are called deciduous forests. Forests that lose their leaves, usually during the winter. If you went north of us, not too far actually, you would get into a conifer forest of evergreen trees. You know, if you travel north or if you travel up mountains, what you'll notice is the trees change into mostly like spruce and fir trees, things like that. If you went way far north, you would find the tundra is the biome that you would typically find. Certain parts of the world, you know, South America, you find tropical rainforests is the biome that, that forms. Deserts form certain areas of the world. So we call those biomes, and each biome is develops based on the climate. Because of the precipitation and the temperature, that's what determines what biome forms. And they each have different types of organisms that live there. Different organisms have adapted over time, have evolved to be able to take advantage of these different biomes. So obviously, if you go to the desert, you're going to find different types of plants and animals than you would find in the temperate deciduous forest where we live. And they would be different from what you would find in a grassland, which would be different from a tropical rainforest. So we have this term that we use called biodiversity. So diversity just means differences. Biodiversity is related to differences between living things. An ecosystem with a high biodiversity has many different species present. And typically what we think of is that the more biodiversity there is in an ecosystem, the more stable it, would, it will be. The more resistant it is to disturbances, to diseases, things like that. Some biomes have really high biodiversity. The tropical rainforest has amazing numbers of plants and animals and fungi, etc., that can live there. Other ecosystems, a desert has biodiversity, but much less than the tropical rainforest. Different ecosystems have different um, amounts of biodiversity. But one of the things that we're going to be talking about in the next section of this is that humans, because of our use of the land, because of pollution and climate change and other factors, are impacting biodiversity throughout the world, reducing biodiversity leading to species becoming extinct. And that presents a problem. Once a species is extinct, it's gone, right? There's no bringing it back. And as we, if we reduce biodiversity, it also means we're reducing the stability of these ecosystems. And there are certain species, we call them keystone species, that if they are eliminated from an ecosystem, they have huge impacts on the entire ecosystem. We're gonna watch a video about one keystone species here in a minute. Oftentimes they're predators, like mountain lions. Take, even though there may not be many mountain lions in a given area, if they are eliminated, it has huge impacts throughout the entire ecosystem. And we're gonna look at an example of that right now. 